Hey guys, this will be video 14 for the Design Build Flying V. And I'm going to spend, uh, I'm going to try to keep this video around 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes tops. But uh, I'm going to discuss the uh, body in reference to the uh, initial neck pocket work. And then um, later on, we'll finish out talking about the the neck and how I'm going to build it up to fit it into this body, as well as the, uh, the headstock. I reworked the headstock this morning into more of the traditional uh, flying V style, and it turned out really good. It looks kind of rough because it's all, you know, uh, wrapped up and clamped up and everything, but uh, I'll probably pull it out of all that uh, clamp work in a little while, and we'll show you kind of what you can expect to see when you're uh, pulling that type of stuff off. Um, so let's start out with uh, the neck pocket work first. And uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how you would fit a traditional um, neck. In other words, like a bolt-on. I shouldn't have said traditional because if you're thinking traditional for the Flying V, it's definitely a tenon. Uh, for about five minutes, we'll talk about, well, probably not even that long. We'll talk about how we would fit a bolt-in neck. Uh, first off, if you're going to do the bolt-in neck, uh, we would have made certain that our body was no more than about one and three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, because this body is, well, I don't have to measure it. I know my body is one and seven eighths. So you'd be surprised what that additional one eighth of an inch will do visually especially once you you put just a bolt on neck on it you'll have an enormous area down there and it'll be obvious that it wasn't really intended to have a bolt on neck so if you were going to do a bolt in neck you've made the decision to make certain that you kept your body at about one and three quarter or possibly even less and then uh basically what you would be doing is rather than rather than working with uh a very straight uh, tongue, in other words, a, a very much uh, a tenon uh, direction, which is very much on center line, whether it's one and a quarter inch wide or one and a half or one and three quarter, that that's really makes no difference when you're building custom. But everything about the uh, tenon neck, like the traditional uh, Gibson, uh, whether they're a short tenon uh, for like a, uh, SG or well no the SG is, is through but uh, like the flying V some of them have a short I believe and that are medium or long regardless of what type tenon it's straight if it's one and a quarter down here it's going to be one and a quarter all the way but if you're doing a uh, traditional you know uh, fender type neck they're tapered uh, obviously because of the, the nut is a roughly one and uh, five eighths to one and eleven sixteenths and this measurement up here is going to typically be two and three sixteenths of an inch. And in case I forget, one of the main reasons I bought this neck is because it's actually two and one quarter of an inch. So uh, that was a huge plus to me that I got a, I got a Fender esque type neck, but I got my nice two and a quarter inch width. But where I'm going with this is this. Uh, let me see if I got a straight edge here. Man, I never. Well, it would be just as easy to show with the with this fretboard. It's a trapezoidal path, and I think you know where I'm going with this. When you're doing a trapezoidal path, you would want to route out that neck pocket to mimic exactly what is going to be installed in that neck pocket, even if it only is is wider at the at the farthest distance, just by one millimeter. Well, let's 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 do a half millimeter over here and a half millimeter over there, and let's make sure that we taper it. That's especially if you're doing a bolt in, because you have got to have some sort of uh, substance holding that thing, and um, and you just do. So anyway, uh, I, I, again, I want to spend about one more minute talking about this, but the way you would do that, it would just be uh, uh, first off, you're going to be doing a, a flat pocket. And you know that it's going to be tapered, and I'll, I'll uh, I guess I could use that. That's that's so dirty. Uh, let me just use this. 
even though it's not wide enough. But basically what you could do, if you knew that was going to be the area that you were going to want to route out, you could just come up here and, and tape all this off. And you could simply take your uh, CA glue or your jet glue, and after you've drawn the lines on that trapezoidal taper, just simply uh, temporarily glue those uh, three-quarter inch thick sticks of wood across one there and then one here and then come up here where you want it to end and just do a little cross member and then simply route it out and if you think that you're going to be routing down um, if you know that you're not going to be routing beyond say seven eighths of an inch well let's make the first path at about I don't know maybe uh, maybe a half of an inch in other words, don't try to hit it the first shot. Ease down to your target because you might realize that you don't have the, the bearing collet tied or that you might not have something um, uh, in, in good working order. And it's good to discover that before you get too far into the job. But basically, if you've got that flat surface, if it's tapered, then you just start routing it out. And then it's as simple as you just put your neck in and your neck is on a flat plane and you built a you know nice little guitar. It's it's pretty simple, uh, but it is what it is. But we chose with this guitar. I think we had all always yeah. I know I had always mentioned that I'm going to be doing some sort of tenon. I don't know exactly what that tenon is going to be, but I'm going to transition into talking about the tenon uh, in the make sure that's in the camera uh, in in the fact that. Um, this is all this is very much flat this this bottom this bottom here is flat and you might be thinking well I thought you were gonna pitch it well yeah I am I am going to pitch it but the cool thing about this uh, my 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 target ledge out here is probably going to be about another uh, almost a quarter of an inch that's probably where the bottom is truly going to be now it won't be that that deep up there because it's it's on it's on that pitch you know it'll be on on the pitch so it'll be taller now it'll be more shallow back here from the surface down so on that note how do you achieve that well i'll cross that bridge later on and we'll, we'll discuss you know having this uh template in here which is cut on the pitch that i want and things like that and how i can just simply put that up there i'll talk about that in a minute but i'm just wanting to drive home the fact that even with this pocket right here if i wanted to i could put tape up there and if i'm going to go with a one and one half inch wide uh, uh, pocket then I just work off the center line. And if I'm not working off the center line of the body, I'm gonna be working off the center line of the neck in relation to the bridge, because something may have changed. So regardless, let's say I found the center line that I want to work with. It just so happens that the center line of this body is perfectly in line with my bridge, so I can trust, I can, I can truly trust the glue join of the body as a, as a reference of my center line. And it even goes all the way up here and then I go from there. So I've got this, uh, these cowboy uh, boards glued up here with jet glue and it's all temporary and it's just, just enough to get me in the game. But uh, I almost, I jumped ahead of myself. Before I did that, even once I had my boards uh, glued in place up there, I put it on the drill press and I, <coughs> excuse me, I just used the, the the boards and I stepped in about an eighth of an inch and I just roughed out that mass and I made certain certain that my drill uh, bit didn't go down too far and I set the depth gauge on my drill and I just masked out, I re relieved a lot of that mass and then I took my router, I forgot to get the bit, let me, let me get the bit and I'll show you. It may still be in the router, there it is. See if that's in the camera. That's the bit. Is that in the camera? You can see it's, it's got the bearing right there, the bearing on the top. So uh, 
is this the first bit I used? You know, honest to God. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, just, I, was, I was drawing a blank there for a second, thinking that maybe I started with my little short bit first, but I didn't. That was the whole idea. I relieved all of this crap out in the middle. Then I was able to take a very confident uh, uh, ease around the corner. See, this bearing was up here riding on this initial uh, um, template. Uh, up at this surface and then I was just easing off the walls easing off the walls and then once I got those walls eased off I, I, I probably no I couldn't have not not with this really long bit but if I was using my little short bit I would have been able to pull all of that uh, temporary uh, jig work off and then just move to using using the uh, I, then I could have moved to using uh, one of my shorter bits with the bearing, you know, transferred over because they're, they're quarter inch. And then I could have run the bearing on the inside up against the pine and then uh, used, used the actual pocket as my template. And I, I'm sorry it took me a long while to get that out, but that's where I was going with that. Uh, just explaining that if especially especially if you're using that sweet little short bit right there, you can use a really shallow uh, uh, routing uh, template. And then, um, you know, the bearings running about right here and you just route out about a half inch and then maybe move it down a little bit, route out to about three quarter. And then you're, then you're at a point where you could remove all of that stuff and then just start using the actual body as the uh, routing template. And it guarantees you that you don't, that nothing slips. Cause if you're up here with this really long bit and you made a mistake and something slipped or whatever, whatever mistake happens up here, it's going to get transferred all the way down. That also substantiates the fact why I love just working right off the body rather than building this endless, not, not this, but just in general, if I was just going to route out this one pocket, and I knew I wasn't going to be routing out 10, 10 of these pockets in some sort of custom design. Well, man, I'm just going to glue the sticks up there and, and basically like that right there. And uh, I temporarily glue them. I'm just going to route it out and I'm going to pull them off and throw them in the box because I'll use them on the next guitar. <clears throat> but if I'm doing production work, then I'll build something like this uh, uh, or something that's real critical where I've got some really nice wood that I don't want to risk damaging then I'll use this, uh, something like this. So anyway, I digressed a little bit, or kind of uh, went off the rails, as I say, on that a little bit. But I just want to let you know that if you're routing for a bolt-on neck, it's the same operation. The only difference is you'll be tapering a little bit so that you got a really, really nice, uh, uh, tight, supportive pocket for the neck that you're installing. All right, I'm going to get this stuff off the... Uh, table because I don't think there's any more reason to talk about that and uh, we'll transition into uh, I'll just look at my notes here so I don't start getting off point so flat neck pocket first then use the uh, uh, pocket itself as your finished template uh, relieve the mass with the uh, Horstner bit and then um, then you're ready okay and then then you're ready Maybe not even today. Maybe we're not going to be doing the neck for another day or two. But at a minimum, we know that, well, what was that tenon we've decided to go with? Well, then we could just, we, it, we, we don't want to just, just measure what we've got and go, oh, yeah, okay, so it's 40 millimeter or it's one and a half or something like that. And then when you're building up your neck or, or you're literally building your brand new neck, or let's say you've got your brand new neck sitting over there that you have not cut the tenon yet, well, you just simply cut the tenon to match, you know, what, what it's, you know, what, what it's going to be fitting into. In other words, it's, you're just fitting everything on the side. Uh, in other words, where I'm going is you don't have to do the pitching yet. That's the long, uh, uh, that, that was the long way about what I was trying to get at. It's just to explain to you that 
leave a little bit of mass there and we'll do our pitch work later on because we, we might want to do things like uh, measure the, the taper path, the ta taper path, P-A-T-H, across the tops of those uh, uh, pickup rings. Uh, we might have decided, uh, yeah, we heard about this whole thing where you can either tilt tilt the Floyd Rose to go with the string path, blah, 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 or maybe you're going to run the Floyd Rose a little bit more flat on the body, things like that. Uh, so in other words, we might be doing a little bit more engineering, but at a minimum, we knew that we had to have a starting width and a starting depth and a starting, uh, uh, a starting run depth and then a starting vertical depth. Uh, so that's what I meant by that. Because we can change it later on. And if you want to, well, that would be a what if. Uh, in other words, if, if I if I realized, oh man, I made a mistake. Well, don't fret it. Just grab some epoxy and and come in here. This is pretty important. Uh, let's let's say something happened and it got out of control. Oh man, I, oh it just barely does fit. How about that? What are the odds of that? That's incredible. Let's say you screwed something up, and I swear I didn't plan that. That's a perfect fit. And let's say you had to come in. And, and uh, let's say you went too deep, or maybe you, you went so deep that you weren't going to be able to get a pitch. Well, then you can simply come in here and cut a little fillet, do some nice epoxy work. It shouldn't be that tight. You would want it to be loose enough so that it would be able to drop in fairly easily. And then you just clamp that baby in, all that epoxy dries, and you're all good to go. And then you can come run your router again and, and bring it back up to where your target was. So... In other words, you don't want to make a habit of doing stuff like that, but there's nothing wrong with, uh, uh, I, I, I thought of something that, that I might want to mention. If you're working on a vintage body, something that's really valuable, and you're doing cowboy stuff like that, do that type stuff to the, the neck that you built. Don't start modifying a vintage body. And I'll digress back to the uh, custom Les Paul that I restored. Uh, where, where that Les Paul was all routed out, the original luthier did such an incredible job removing the neck that I didn't see any need in going in and changing Gibson's uh, one in, this is one and one quarter. I didn't see any, any reason um, uh, of going in and changing any of their work because their work was so precise. If there was anything wrong, it was going to be the neck that I built. Or if I was going to do a little bit of shaving here, a little, a little, a little shaving over here, here, or there, or on the bottom. Let's say I messed something up. Rather than gluing a fillet in the bottom, well, I would have glued a fillet to the bottom of my neck. That way, if something happened again and they had to remove the neck, the, the body would still be original is what I'm trying to say. So uh, sometimes... If you're doing restoration or repairs, make sure that you pre pre preserve uh, factory original stuff as much as possible because uh, that's pretty pretty incredible. That would greatly affect the value of something if you went in there and started uh, rerouting or redesigning uh, things like that. All right, let me look at uh, my notes. Uh, final call for a net pickup. Is this the final call? Believe it or not, it's believe it or not, it's actually not. Even if you had your neck glued in and you had strung it up and you had been playing it for however long you've been playing it and all you had was just the, the bridge pickup, you could still come in. Um, I wish I had uh, like a router base. You could still come in and set up some sort of like a floating jig. You know, and let's say that was just like a pickup cavity. And then you could just, you, you could route, uh, and you could hover above and route over all this custom stuff and even guarantee that you did not, did not damage anything. So it's not really the final call, but it certainly is the final call if you decided, yeah, man, what the heck, I'm just going to route for that little neck pup. Uh, it would be the final call for you to do something very simple like, throw some masking tape down and jet glue a little board there and jet glue a little board there and then a little little stop block on either end and hit it with the router like a cowboy. So yeah, it would be, it would be a final call before you glue this neck in. 
to do it real easy. And, and there's a very, I'm about 99% certain that I'm going to go ahead and route out the neck pickup and it will be for the single coil. And at, if that's not sufficient for uh, the person that I sell it to, it, I'll let them know, hey man, I'll be more than happy to, to route you a bridge PAF or, you know, humbucker. And personally, it really doesn't look that bad. And, and if you want to know the truth, it really does, it does, does not look bad at all. And as we've already discussed, uh, it's, it's very much traditional. You know, it, when you're looking at the relationship of the neck pickup to the bridge pickup and the bridge itself, it's not like we've got a 24 fret fretboard and, and we're running into this kind of crap right here. We're not doing that. So starting up here with the single coil is still real cool because we still have all this uh, beautiful uh, groovy uh, uh, red uh, crimson sparkle. And to me, I think that's, I hope that's in the camera okay. It may be a little bit too close, but to me, I, I really like that. It's, uh, is it traditional um, Gibson? No, but neither is the guitar. Again, we're just complimenting, complimenting the Karina. So on that note, uh, I'm pretty confident that I am going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to do it on on camera, but I'll just, uh, I'm, and again, I may change my mind and elect not to do it. But uh, right now I'm thinking about, I really would like to, at a minimum, we've got our hole drilled in there for the wiring if we if I do decide to go that route. So so is it a final call for the neck pickup? It is if you want if you want it to be easy uh, and without risking damaging the neck because if something happens in that a little little oil platform esque uh, routing jig got off, you could do some pretty major damage. And uh, and and there you have it. All right. At this point uh I'd say take a break and revisit your uh, layout. I'm just going to hit this briefly. I would revisit my whole layout configuration, the controls, and how you're going to use. We've pretty much, I'm about 100% confident. Well, I am 100% confident on these four whole locations right here. But because we have the large uh, control cavity back there, there's a very, very strong possibility I'm going to go ahead and set a precedent as to where the first DPDT switch should go. And I may go ahead and drill and drill that. At a minimum, I know for a fact it's not going to hinder anything up here. But uh, I guess what I'm saying, I'm I'm still I'm still doing some design work, is what I'm saying. Why? Because this is a prototype. I'm still kind of prototyping this thing. And I like the fact that that um, I don't have to make that choice yet. And I may wake up tomorrow and go, nope. I, I've already told everyone I'm going to sell the guitar. If if you know that might that might spook somebody away, thinking that oh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid I'm going to be jamming my pinky into that DPDT switch. So I might make a mistake and hurt the value of my sale by putting that there. So all I'm saying is just kind of kind of realize that, that that your options are still there, but just proceed with extreme caution about uh, getting too personal. Uh, that might seem like a personal move routing for that uh, single coil neck pickup, but as I've already clarified, or I think I did, that uh, at a minimum uh, it really needs another pickup because I've already you know, set up all the controls for it. So it's kind of obvious that you would not have these controls unless there was going to be something going up here. So on that note, uh, it'd be better to start with the single coil and have like a, a little 59 Seymour Duncan in there that's real hot and just is a blazing little, little pickup in its own right. It's four conductor. If you wanted to do some trick wiring down there, maybe run it in... Uh, Parallel sounds really good, even on the, the little 59. Uh, splitting a little 59 sounds horrible. I, I just would give you some suggestions. It, it didn't sound good at all when I split a little 59. Uh, but it did sound really nice when I, 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 I ran it in parallel versus series. Um, 
So again, I might have digressed a little bit, or maybe I got a little bit too technical there, but I just wanted to clarify that at a minimum, if somebody says, oh, you know, I kind of like it, but I don't, uh, or maybe when I list it on to, to sell, I'll let everyone know, hey, if you want, if you want, I'd be more than happy to route for a uh, uh, neck, neck pup for you. Uh, and those are those things that it, it won't take me any time at all. I've already got the jigs for it, and they know it's, it's basically free, so it might... At a minimum, uh, they're they're going to have the option. And again, uh, if I'm a blues cat, man, I'm going to be fine with a duck bucker or a little 59 because I know what I can do with those two pickups. And then if I want to, you know, peel the paint off the wall, I can go with a JB. Or if I want to do some real sweet, you know, just, you know, uh, 70s esque uh, rock and roll 60s s rock and roll then i can go with a with a, a 7.8 you know paf or something down there some kind of something kind of lightweight all right let me check the time we're 25 minutes and we talked or i talked about the body probably in extensive detail uh, talked about revisiting the layout and uh i guess if anything i'm glad that i wrote this because i would have completely forgotten it but if you are in doubt about any of these things, well, then, as I've said before, there's your answer. If you're in doubt, then you, you are in doubt. So if you're in doubt, don't pull the router out and start making, you know, uh, judgment calls, you know, like that, because you might wake up tomorrow and realize, oh, man, that was just wrong. And, and I say that to say this. Especially, I would especially not route that if you were only going to start building bodies. This is so important. If you're only going to be building bodies and selling bodies and maybe pre-routed like that so that someone else can finish it off, then I very much would recommend do not route uh, this neck pickup because they may change the scale. Uh, they may want to go with a 21 fret uh fretboard yeah this is this is some pretty important stuff even though this is way off the off the, the cuff uh and, and you guys already know there's our 18th fret roughly this is a 20 uh what is this this is a 24.75 inch scale it's a little bit different but it's close enough for for consideration here but they may hate the idea that there's a little bit of real estate right there and this is so important that we're talking about this because they may be sitting there thinking, oh man, if they had just left that pickup alone or, or hadn't, if they hadn't have routed for a humbucker right there, then I could have gone with a 21 fret fretboard and put the, the PAF right there and no one would have ever not, you see what I'm saying? And I'm sounding a little melodramatic there, but let's, we'll say that's the 18th fret. And then that would have allowed them to put their true PAF humbucker up there and been in, in more line with what they wanted to do. But you could offer this, or if they say, yeah, man, I don't even know how to, how to plug a router up, let alone use one, then you might say, well, then cool, let, why don't we do this? Let's select a scale, and if you know you want a PAF, then let me go ahead and route that for you. But keep in mind, if we go with this neck, or this fretboard scale, just keep in mind your, you know, your PAF is going to be down here, blah, 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 blah. In other words, this is where you start moving into that. Uh, you're offering something that, that the big boys don't, just can't hardly offer unless they're charging thousands of dollars for it. And what does it cost us in our shop, in our basement, or, or you know, uh, downtown in a really affordable little location? If it if it gets if it if it makes a difference between whether or not we sell the guitar for fifteen hundred dollars, man, I'll do it for free, you know. Or you might do it for free uh, if we're going to sit there and be holding on to this guitar that otherwise we might have been able to have sold. Then I say uh, let's offer some custom options. Anyway, so that's kind of going into the whole realm of starting your own business if you wanted to do that so when in doubt wait otherwise uh if you're only building selling the bodies then certainly wait but offer the options all right now i think what i'm gonna do i'm gonna probably pause the video briefly uh get the table in order regroup and then i'm gonna prepare to transition into talking about the uh net construction 
Okay, very briefly, I'm going to revisit something that I had demonstrated in one of the uh, first videos, probably video four or five in this. When I mentioned, uh, like, building your own little temporary uh, rowdy jig, what I meant by, you know, just jet gluing it down, what you do, let's say this is your uh, uh, guitar body, and this was a location that you wanted to uh, route out, and uh, or let's say the location was going to be on the inside of this tape. Well, what you could do is you. And I'm sorry, I, I, I'm kind of doing this off the cuff, but let, let's say that you were going to route along that line right there, okay? And let's say you were going to route there, so you're going to route out this area right here, okay? What I'm going to show you, and, and what I meant by building a little uh, temporary jig is you can use masking tape uh, well if I can get it to, I want to try to keep it as clean as possible because this is going to be the inside of your jig and what what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be gluing that temporarily right there on that line and how do you do that uh, this is what I call jet glue or CA glue this is the medium you don't want to use the thin for this because the crap would run all over the place uh, but let me see if I can get my arm out of the way. I'm, I'm really bad about doing something and then I'm not even paying attention to the fact that you guys can't even see it. So you should be able to see that. There's really no need to put any glue on this. And you can make the decision as to do you want to put the drops of glue on the little board that you're gluing down or do you want to just put it on your subject. I'm going to get behind the camera and just show you. I'll try to get the light, and then I'll try to look down and make sure I don't screw it up. And it's funny, I'm sitting here realizing, hell, it doesn't matter if I miss it. All I'm doing is showing you how to glue glue a little board in place. And then and then this is what's, what most people don't do. You, you can just hold it briefly. It's already dry right now, but it's not dry enough to crank up the router it would probably go ahead and turn loose. And what I would do at this point, I had moved them, use a larger clamp or just put a little bit of clamping pressure on it. That will just guarantee. And then let it set for about 10 minutes. And that's overkill, but that'll guarantee that that really, really glues in place. Then, after it is glued in place, then you're able to come in with your router bit and, and that bearing will run across that little jig and do your routing, route out that area. And then when you're through, you simply tear it off. And that's what's going to happen. Typically, the tape is going to tear loose from one of the boards and then you simply pull it off. And believe it or not, I was able to put tape on the uh, on the uh, sparkle, the Delmar sparkle, and I didn't get excessive with the drops. I put just enough to make sure that it, it glued. I'd rather have four little bitty dots than two fat ones that might ooze out and get on on the surface. So when in doubt use way too much tape and cover the surface but that's what i meant by doing little jigs for that type of stuff and, and that's for you guys that have been really good watching uh most of the videos you've already seen that but if someone has just tripped up on that that'll that will clarify what i'm talking about and anytime you hear me i mentioned jet glue that's what i'm talking about all right, let's talk about the neck a little bit and how I, or let, more specifically, let's talk about the headstock, the headstock re, re, reconstruction. And let me just get behind the camera before I take it out of its clamps, and I'll do a flyby. This is your typical little uh, trailer ratchet strap. Uh, very little tension here. All it is, it's just enough. I'll go over it briefly. This is... This was basically after I machined the headstock down. That's what I built up, and I epoxy glued it around the headstock. Now, I will not do any more machine work for about another 24 hours on this or sometime tomorrow. 
because I like working with the 24 hour uh, slow dry epoxy. Uh, but you just, you want to use the ratchet strap and this is pretty important. Um, before, uh, let me pause the video and I'm going to, I'm going to go make a cut. I'm going to show you what's critical because that right there would not work. And I don't want anyone to be deceived by that. So be right back. Okay. So that's what you're going to have to have because you want your strap to very much come across this and, 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 and have a very clean and straight pull. Although you're putting very little tension on this, uh, there's no sense in it being uh, crazy and cocked and, and possibly pulling on one side. So uh, that's the little surround. That's all it took for me to turn. And, and if you want to know the truth, which of course I want to be honest, uh, probably 80% of this is going to get cut off. I mean, it's amazing how much of that's going to get 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 cut off. So it, it only took a very, very small amount. And this will all get rounded up here. So, so basically, uh, I only needed just enough to kind of create the outline of the traditional headstock because that headstock was already so close to it. But you got to be real nice and true. And I took the time to go ahead and just make certain that that stayed perfect, perfectly, perfectly in the center. It wasn't important because this is all going paint grade, but this take advantage of this. This is, this is, I'm glad I'm thinking this take advantage of opportunities like this to really perfect your craft. You know, even though, you know, I don't matter. I'm going to paint over it's epoxy can fill it in. Well, that's cool. Well, let's, let's try to build it as though we're going to clear coat it and let's find out just how good we are with our table saw, with our, uh, you know, miter saw, our, 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 our little hand saws. In other words, uh, take this, take this opportunity to get better at your craft. And you might realize that, wow, man, I'm, I'm yeah, if I wanted to, man, I could, I could just, uh, I could, let me back up. You wouldn't want to sh show that type work on the surface, but where I'm going, this is, this is a uh, bird's eye maple and it has some beautiful bird's eye in it. Where, where, where the thickness of this headstock is, if I wanted to, man, I could leave a lot of that exposed and do like a distressed uh, guitar and you would see all of that natural bird's eye. And then even if you turn the guitar and you look and you go, wow, look at this, look at these, you know, these center lines are perfect. And am I saying that's what you're going to do? I'm going to do on this guitar. Absolutely not. I'm painting the whole thing, but all I'm saying, use this opportunity to get good at what you're doing. And you might realize Hey man, I, I might be able to take this other neck that I've got over there and actually treat it this way and it be a clear coat neck. So that's what I glued around the surface and let's uh, pull it out of the straps. I don't know if I've, I've done the flyby yet, but basically, yeah, I need to show you how you would do the, the clamp up. The first thing you do is you mix up your epoxy and you do your, uh, uh, these are maple. These are maple dowels. They're split dowels. These are solid, but these up here are split. Anytime, if you see a little crescent moon, it's only because the new the new tuner is going to cut out every bit of that. Uh, and then down here, the, the new tuner is is basically. I hope that's in the camera. The the new tuner location is going to be somewhere up there, and the the second tuner will be right there. So just plan your job accordingly. And you'll realize that, well, I don't need to fit this perfectly because every bit of it's going to get drilled out anyway. But the way I did this repair, I did all the dowel work first. And here's a testament to the epoxy. I mixed up every bit of the epoxy to do this job. And I had enough time while my epoxy was sitting on the table kind of kicking on a molecular level. I had, I had already fit. I had already fit this now. Okay. And I knew that was ready to glue on and it was uh, actually this uh, it was much thicker than what it is here and this is where I cut it down before I glued it on but I had it pre-shaped and ready to go I had the headstock pre-shaped and pre-cut and ready to receive then I had all my dowel rods cut but I hadn't I hadn't finished fitting them yet mixed up my epoxy, let it kick, and I had enough time to do this entire operation with one epoxy uh, operation. And I'm so glad I thought of this because 
um, you don't want to turn this into a 48 hour proposition. Uh, I was able to do all these first and get them leveled where I wanted. I'm working most of the surface. I'll be taking off most of the material off the back because I'm riding a little bit proud on the back back here. But I'm, I'm, and I'm riding a little bit proud on the front, but not, not, not a lot uh, because I don't want an excessive amount of work up here because I run the risk of damaging a fretboard. So on that note, uh, you would uh, put the uh, all the new dowels in. And this is parchment paper wrapped around a little piece of. I uh, hope that should that's probably should be shown in the camera. It's just a little piece of quarter inch. Uh, well, that might be three sixteenths inch plywood. And then what is that piece right there for? It helped level. It helped assure, okay, it, it acted as a leveling surface to make certain that the face of the headstock, uh, once I started putting this clamping tension on there, if it moved anywhere at all, I wanted it to move up in and, and stay perfectly flush. So it just assured that I had uh, the strap in a location that went over the headstock, but then it, it also acted as a means by which it was a, a leveling surface. So, or a leveling, um, uh, it, it would be, I guess that would be a call, C-A-U-L. It would be like a clamping call. So with that clamping call in place, then I was able to put just a ginger amount of, of pressure on the, on the clamp and pull that down. And then I tighten this up a little bit. And was it sliding and slipping and moving around a little a little bit? Not really. Uh, it, it, it was a little bit, but not so much that you couldn't control it. And once I put this a little bit, look at that. That's just, that's not even wrist tight. It was just enough to, to make certain I had a flat surface. And then once I knew I had a flat surface, I could stop worrying about what was up under this parchment paper. And then I... This, this is actually uh, roughly all the only material that was cut off of the headstock. And I turned it and, and look at that right there. I'll go ahead and take it off if I can get it off. No, I can't even get it off. Yeah. Guess what that is? That's our two pieces of tape that I jet glued on the side. And what did it do? It created a, 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 a surface by which I was able to clamp and make. This was the last clamp that I put on. And, and by doing this, it, it made certain that uh, my uh, additional, the, the ears, the little ears pulled in tight. Again, that was the last clamp. This was the second clamp that I put on because I wanted to make certain that I pulled that up. And then I did that one third. So the last one, the second to the last. And this has been drying for about probably six hours. So it's okay to pull out and uh, that relieved. So let me just get this out of the, I always struggle getting these things apart. I know there's somebody out there that knows the trick, but for some reason I missed that, I missed that class. All right, let me lay that out and get this crap off the table. And we will look at the neck. All right, what time are we? How much time? 43 minutes. All right, what have we got? It's probably gonna be ugly. All right, see our... Clamp there. Okay, and that pulled down enough, that filled in with epoxy. I'm gonna float back over that and do some more fill in. Um, I probably should have put a little bit, a little bit more clamping force on it, but I didn't want to risk uh, it going crazy. I probably could have got that to come down about another, uh, a little bit lower than that, but it'll be okay. Uh, but you saw it in real time. Nothing to hide. Is it perfect? Nah, not really. Does it matter? No, because the only thing it's going to be holding is just the paint up there on the surface. The only thing that's important is all the structural down here. And the cool thing about this, this is all uh, epoxy. And uh, the epoxy will act as a really, really strong 
uh, strong connection from the the new wood to the to the old headstock. So should be good. I get some of this crap off here. I can't. Might might be hard to get off. Again, this type. So I I want you to see this in real time, so you can realize, man, they're they're really ugly when you're when you're doing the the mass work. But uh, once you once you see it, uh, I'm not going to do it now because I'm just going to let it dry overnight. And the cool thing about this right here, I'm glad I took this out. What I can do is I can mix up some more epoxy right now, and I can really crush it down into that uh, that join right there. Because uh, see, my headstock. Once I do the veneer, uh, once I do the veneer on the top. And I'll do the really thin veneer on the back. Anything that might be unsightly or just, you know, repair work, it'll all be covered. Now, is are we doing shoddy work or, or sloppy work? No, man. You're just, it's, would, would I have preferred that it was a precision perfect fit? Yeah, I mean, it would have been awesome. But not, it wasn't nearly as important as these joints right here. Or either the, these joints looking at it from the end down here. So, and it's nice and level. So it'll get the veneer over the top. Let me see roughly where it would be. Probably about right there once it gets the uh, once it gets the Floyd Rose. So that'll get that little bit will get rounded off and it'll be good to go. All right, let's see what else should I talk about? Uh, neck, headstock design, and machine work, hardware finish, and tuners. Uh, and uh, tuners, that's more along the lines of uh, 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 finished discussion. So let me let me think about this. Is there anything else I should talk about in reference to this? Because uh, this is certainly not something you see every day, and you, and you have to ask yourself, well, should I do something like this, or should? And I gotta, gotta be careful. I need to let this. Yeah, I need to let this set just a little bit longer. But right now is a good time while the epoxy is still soft. You can come in and start doing a little bit of cleanup. Now you want to make certain that you discipline yourself enough that, that you don't start trying to finish it. Because this stuff is still real gooey and, and you'll start tearing it out and then you'll have a gap that you're going to have to fill. And we don't want that. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to mix up some epoxy. And I'm going to fill in this little join right here. And then uh, what I'm going to do, let me let me pause the video and I'm going to go ahead and mix up some epoxy. And then I'll show you how I would press that in and kind of clean that up in preparation for tomorrow being able to come in here with uh, some, some really nice uh, uh, leveling. And just utilizing the factory surface there in order to get our Flying V profile. All right, so let me pause it. I'm going to mix up some epoxy, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll finish out the video. Okay, I think we'll be able to finish out the video uh, in this uh, in this uh, step. Um, I've got the epoxy mixed up. I'm going to let it kick for a while, and while it is kicking, I'll go ahead and talk about. Um, I ran. Um, the little saw, my real thin saw down in there, just made sure I had it cleaned out so that I can really get the epoxy down in there. Uh, is it too late to put more pressure on it? Yeah, it's, it's probably already dry. In other words, if you started trying to really crank tension on it, you would probably break it loose back here. So it's best to just let it fill in because we got a real good joint on the back. But what I will talk about is how we're going to turn this neck into basically uh, a, a very much Gibson type of profile. Uh, this is going to be our 18th fret, so we're going to be uh, on a two degree pitch. I'm going to start this one out at two degrees. That I think that'll be safe. It might be a little bit aggressive, but um, I'm pretty confident based on some of my just initial engineering that uh, two degrees is going to be good. That's a four and a half degree pitch right there, which is for an arch top. But what we've got to do We've got to, when we look at the back of this uh, guitar, uh, let me see if I can just get this up. 
here so it's uh see it i won't be able to put it all the way down but let me just get behind the camera and i'll try to it's hard to tell because I, i'm looking through the camera and then i'm looking at the guitar but that's kind of what i'm shooting or that's exactly what i'm shooting for you know the authentic uh uh i have no idea what's showing up but i'm shooting for that heel the real sweet, uh, I think that's about five eighths of an inch from the uh, back, the back wall to the edge of the heel. But I got to transfer that uh, over to the new neck. And how do I do that? Well, I'll have to build it up. And I'm starting from that point right there, which is that, you know. And if you put this behind, I'll see if I can get this in the camera, but I don't think this is going to show. Yeah, that's showing okay. Yeah, that's actually showing very well. That's that's what I'm going to be adding. Let me let me look at this one more time. Okay, now I'll look in the camera. Damn, I got that rag in the back. Sorry about that. Start over here. So what I'll be adding is the black, and it's a little bit off, but it's uh, so I'll be adding not only the black heel right there starting right there and then I'll be uh, adding the tongue you know the tongue back here which will basically be kind of like that right there so there'll be the tongue and then the T which will make the, the heel and then when you look at it from the back and it's, it's gonna look like that right there other than the tongue will be wider so and how will that be done uh, it'll be done with uh, in the world is my sanding block Gosh. bear with me even if I have to pause the video I'm going to pause the video to find that sanding block Yeah, let me pause the video because I've got to find a block of wood alright found it let's finish up uh, I basically will be uh, epoxy gluing a block of about this size right here to the entire bottom of this so that it will become uh, an engineered uh, heel. But the cool thing about the epoxy is once it squeezes out, keep in mind, I'll be moving this contour right here. It'll be, it'll be moving down just a little bit, not much. It'll, it'll start rounding back here, but very quickly, every bit of this mass will just disappear and it will, it will turn into the real cool long, uh, you know, profile that, that we recognize. So that's how you'll do it. I'll the, the, the piece of maple will probably be about that thick right there in order to make up for the heel. All right, now let me, uh, and that's going, that'll follow in the future videos. So I just wanted to cover it in general terms. And maybe I shouldn't have even covered it because I don't want it to be uh, chaotic. But sometimes, it's kind of like just finding this little 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 gap right here. Um, is that embarrassing? Ah, you know, a little bit. I wish it. I wish it had been a little bit better. But it also lets you know that once this guitar is finished, you're going to realize that. Oh man, if if I run into real, uh, really uh, uh, disheartening situations, uh, man, let it go. It's amazing what you can repair and bring back to life. And um, and I guess this is one of the things I had mentioned. I don't know if I mentioned it in this video series, but 90% of the job while you're working on it, it's ugly. I mean, it's it's rough. It's just really ugly. And you're, I'm not because I've, I, I, know, I know where I'm headed. But if you're just starting out, is that in the camera? That should be. I hope I didn't have my hand in the way. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm packing that epoxy in and making certain that the gravity and the pressure from the little uh, stick forces it in. But 90% uh, of the job, and it really doesn't come together until the very end. I mean, the back of that body over there, and it's scratched up really bad from being on the table or there being a a nut or a washer that was up under the, the body and it's scarred up really bad. So, you know, you just have to realize that 
uh, it'll be finished when it's finished. So what I'm going to do here is let gravity kind of take over, and I'm going to I'm going to clean this up first and ask myself, do I want to transfer any of the epoxy over to these locations? And the answer is no, because every I hope this is showing. There's a little hole right there. There's a hole right there. There's a hole there, and there's a hole there. But every bit of that's going to get drilled out. The new the new tuner is going to drill every bit of that out. There will not be a tuner down here, so it's nice and solid. So I'm going to put this epoxy back, and I'm going to pack it back in. And then what I'm going to do is let gravity take its course and uh, set this up. And you'd be surprised that epoxy will 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 it'll find all the voids and settle in. And I, and I don't know if I mentioned this is a T88. I know I didn't mention in this video, but I've mentioned in the past videos that uh, it's a, a T88 epoxy, and that's what the aircraft home the the home built aircraft association. I think it's the only epoxy that, that they will recognize as being safe enough for building home-built aircraft. So it's insanely strong. It's in very much forgiving just by mixing it by hand. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And it's a 24-hour cure time, but it really takes about three days for it to really harden. And uh, you've got about a 25 to 30-minute work time for the stuff we're we're doing uh, you really want to have your your job in order and clamped up or strapped up or finished up within about 30 35 minutes because after that it's like I said after after five or six hours forget it it might still be soft but you're not gonna move it. all right uh, I hope the video did not go very long and I regardless I'm gonna end it <laughs> within seconds uh, I can't think of anything else to talk about I hope I didn't get too crazy and chaotic there when I was trying to show the the hill but, but basically just keep in mind I'm gonna be building the hill up and it'll be painted and once it's painted it's gonna look like that it's gonna have the uh, prof the profile that uh, I originally intended for this guitar all right, guys, I'm going to shut it down right there, and thanks for staying in the ring. And I guess the next video uh, will probably be uh, shaping this. I probably will have it shaped a little bit. I might crank up the uh, uh, oscillating sander and show you guys how I cut all that and make it pretty and, uh, and, and get us back in the, the ring. But otherwise, uh, we'll try to get this thing finished fairly quickly because once I get the veneer on the top and on the back, I'll be ready to drill tuner locations, and this thing's going to come together very quickly. All right, thanks.